Is it possible to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030? The United Nations thinks so, and the guests on this podcast series certainly hope so. But it's going to take effort, innovation, connections and funding. Welcome to Can We End Epidemics, a podcast series by the global biopharmaceutical company Vive Healthcare, in association with its majority shareholder GSK, and developed by FP Studios. I'm Henry Bonsu. Today, we look at how health inequalities challenge potential progress to eradicating AIDS and ask how we can improve access to information, innovation and medicine to reach our goal. With us are Dr. Oni Blackstock, who is a primary care HIV physician. She's also founder and executive director of Health Justice, a US-based racial equity consulting firm supporting health-affiliated organisations. Amanita Calderon Cifuentes is the HIV Research and Advocacy Officer for Transgender Europe, or TGEU. She is a trans feminine Colombian with a PhD in molecular biomedicine who is living with HIV. And Dr. Anamik de Reuter is Vive's Head of Global Medical Sciences. She's also a practicing physician focused mainly on women living with HIV and AIDS. And if I can start, hopefully, on a first name basis, welcome Oni, Amanita and Anamik. Thank you. Hi, Henry. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much, Amanita. All right. I want to find out from each of you um, how inequality, how marginalization manifests itself in each of your individual areas of research and indeed lived experience. I'm going to start off with you, Amanita. I think you're now living in Europe, indeed in Germany, which scores pretty highly on the Rainbow Index of Equality. Yes, Henry, thank you so much for this. So let me just start by dropping you a couple of numbers. The risk for contracting HIV for trans feminine people worldwide is 66 times higher than the general public. 66 times higher. And we're talking about specifically trans feminine people, but we're talking about trans masculine people is 6.8 times higher. So it is still higher than the general public, than cisgender people, and then understanding the general public as people between the ages of 15 and 49 that are cisgender and heterosexual. This just gives you a very general picture of how incredibly affected are the trans communities by the HIV AIDS pandemic. Now, if we go deeper into the different intersections that exist between gender identity, but also race, migration status, and class, you will see that we cannot address this just from one perspective. We need to always understand this process from an intersectional uh, point of view and understand that the lived experiences of trans white men are not the same as the lived experiences of black trans women. Thank you, Anamanita. We will develop some of those uh, themes uh, during our discussion. Oni, what about you uh, working in the United States? You're a physician. You're also an advocate for health justice. Can you explain how you see things from your perspective? Yes, thank you so much, Henry. And I think so many of the themes that Amanita mentioned also resonate um, with what we see here in the United States in terms of the communities that are most impacted. So I think similarly, when we think about sort of race and sexuality here in the United States, again, we see Black and Brown or Latino MSM, men who have sex with men, disproportionately impacted by HIV. Again, we see women of trans experience who are Black and Latina, and also Black cisgender women as well. Um, we know that actually Black women are about 10 to 15 times more likely to acquire HIV than their white women counterparts. And we also see geographic disparities. The new epicenter for the U.S. epidemic is in the southern part of the United States, where many of the states are less likely to have public health insurance for people with lower incomes, where it's much harder to um, get transportation, other access to healthcare. And so since the start of the HIV epidemic, in the United States, we've also seen this sort of browning of the epidemic, I like to say. So initially, the focus is on white gay men. Although we know that Black and Latino communities were impacted from the beginning, they were basically invisibilized. But now we actually have this sort of hyper-invisibility, and these communities are the ones that are sort of bearing the disproportionate burden. And I think, as Amanita may have been alluding to, you know, we want to make sure that there are people with lived experience, people from the communities most impacted, that are leading the solutions to ending the epidemic. Anamik, what about 
your vantage point. You're the head of global medical sciences at Vive, but you're also a practicing physician working with women living with HIV and AIDS. Can you talk about what you see? I can. So I've been looking after people living with HIV really since it all began in 19... I'm going to make you all realize how old I am now. Started in 1987 when I first started looking after people with living with HIV when essentially working in a sexual health clinic. And at that point, primarily gay men were walking in with what was AIDS and we had to move very quickly and set up the first AIDS ward in London at that time. But the bit that for me is the impediment at the moment, what we need to get over to ending the epidemic is actually helping those people who do have access to everything that is available actually get that access to what is available to them. But for various reasons, they feel they can't at the moment. And for women, for me, that's always been very striking, that whole fear of discrimination, the stigma, if somebody sees them in the clinic, it stops them coming to clinic and all of that. I see a lot of women who are migrant women who have already have three children who don't have anywhere to live. That's their priority. And it's not me saying to them, you need to do this, this, this and this. It's actually, you know, how am I going to put a roof over my head? There are also particularly the cultural differences and constraints that some of the women that I see face in. I've had several women that will say to me when I've spoken to them about, I think we should change your medication. I think we can do something better. They still have to ask their partner to allow them to do so. The other thing I think where there are some inequalities are I get a lot of people who may come in with a big stack of, I've read all about this, I want to go this on this, 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 and this. That doesn't tend to be women. That tends to be men. And it tends to be the women who, I think, in my view, get left on treatments that other people would have been switched off because they're not necessarily in a position to advocate for themselves or have the ability to access information at home and perhaps also it's a laziness of us as healthcare workers not actually addressing it and just leaving them on what they're on you know we have the phrase if it ain't broke don't fix it i do think that there are inequalities as well in the levels of support that people can get to help them access what they need and i saw somebody in clinic just the other day a young man of color you know, he's not been able to tell anybody at all about his diagnosis, his sexuality, and won't access any support group. And you worry whether that individual is going to come back to see you or whether he will disappear. For the women as well, the support groups are massively important, but not everybody will attend them. And I always I say to them, if you go, I promise you, you will actually get something out of it. But you know, many people won't walk through the door. I've gone slightly off topic here, but... No, you haven't. I mean, it's very important. I think it's really important that we talk about that granular detail and the day-to-day encounters you have, both positive and sometimes, sadly, negative. I'm going to go back to Amanita. I'm wondering, as the HIV Research and Advocacy Officer for Transgender Europe, working and living among people who are supposed to be recipients, activists sometimes vulnerable. Can you explain how the relationships are working with larger organisations and what needs to change to better deliver the kind of equality that will change lives and improve access? Okay, so in order to answer that question, I need to go a few steps before and I need to tell you a little bit of the barriers that we are facing because the barriers that we face are from a systemic perspective, from an economic perspective, and from a cultural perspective. And specifically when it comes to the systemic barriers, I would like to, for example, highlight that within the European Union, according to the latest report released by the ECDC, only 22 countries are making trans people eligible to have access to PrEP across Europe and Central Asia from a big number of like plus 50 countries, right, that we have in the region of Europe and Central Asia, only 22 uh, deem trans people eligible to have access to PrEP. And so if the legislation is not creating enough support for the trans people to have access to medication to prevent HIV, then how are we even going to be able to protect ourselves from the virus, from the infection? Now, we are working really closely with, for example, ESWA, which is European Sex Work Alliance. We're working very closely with Correlation, which is a harm reduction network here in Europe. So we can all get together and tackle an issue that affects 
trans sex workers, trans people that use drugs, trans migrants, refugees and undocumented uh, people. At the end of the day, these populations overlap a lot. And we're talking about basically the same group of people affected by mental health, affected by discrimination, by xenophobia, by racism, by sexism. And it is precisely those forms of bigotry within the system and within the culture, the ones that we need to tackle together in order for us to eventually overcome the systemic barriers that we're facing. We've talked about variations within Europe, variations within one big country, the United States. But what about in the hugely diverse African continent, which often makes headlines for the wrong reasons when it comes to LGBTQ and marginalised people and HIV AIDS. Anamik, I know that you're particularly impressed with one country, Botswana. Can you explain why you're impressed with Botswana and one or two other countries in that region and what perhaps some of the high net worth countries might be able to learn from what they're doing there? One of the things that I've said on a number of occasions is that you are in a better position being a woman living in Botswana with HIV than you might be in several areas in the United States in terms of what access you get. I mean, we all know the figures 1990 and Botswana has hit 95, 95, 95. And for those listeners who aren't so aware, those are that 95% of people who have HIV should be diagnosed, of whom 95% should be on treatment, of whom 95% should have an undetectable viral load, which is kind of the, the aim of it all. And that is what we're all striving towards for everybody. And that is something that a country like Botswana has achieved. And I think we'd all agree that there's a number of countries, including in the US, that that's not universally the case. And They've got one health system. You know, everybody falls under the same sort of guidelines that if you have HIV, you can go and get tested and you can go on treatment. And there seems to be very good a will to do innovative research quite early on and a lot of uh, involvement between medical practitioners and their governments and the departments of health with people really working together well to acknowledge that this is important for the country and it's something that you can do something about. And I think we can all learn from that, including us in the UK. Hmm. And only that's a really encouraging example. One wonders how one can get a message across that if you want good, comprehensive, universal basic health care, this is an essential element of it too. Right. I think Anamik spoke to the strengths of having a coordinated health system. I think the challenge is the United States, we actually do not have a health system, a system we think of as something that has these different parts that are coordinated to produce a certain outcome. We have a much more sort of fractionated system of hospitals and clinics, and some people are insured or not. And so we see when there are these really stark inequities, we know that epidemics, for instance, like HIV, really track along sort of the margins of society. And then when we have differences like 20 years in life expectancy between Black men and white men or Indigenous men and white men in the United States, we see the impact um, across all conditions, in particular, I would say HIV. So in the United States, we do see a great deal of structural homophobia that exists, which means we have policies that disproportionately do harm to um, gay men, in particular, or black gay men. So we still in a number of states have HIV criminalization laws. So even if someone is not quote unquote intentionally exposing someone, they can face criminal charges and potentially prison in certain states. So a lot of the work that grassroots advocates are also doing is working to update these laws with the science. Like we know undetectable equals untransmittable. And for the listeners, that means when someone living with HIV um, who is taking their medications, adhering to it, and is virally suppressed, they have effectively no risk of passing HIV on to their sexual partner. So many of these laws are out of date. They're just not based on science, and they have a disproportionate impact, in particular, on Black gay men. I just wanted to add that this is precisely what we need. The path that ends AIDS is not a mystery. It's a conscious choice. It's a choice that we all do together, and it's precisely about targeting the bigotry within the systems, targeting the homophobia, the sexism, the transphobia, the racism and the xenophobia that bring in together all these systemic and cultural barriers that make it impossible for people to protect themselves from the virus or to reach, for example, as Oni mentions, a undetectable viral load and make themselves untransmittable. Good point, Amanita. But you talk about targeting laws and in some countries they've tried to change laws. Look at Scotland. For example, in the UK, the governing party, the Scottish National Party, has tried to put through a Gender Recognition Reform Act. 
and of course tried to empower the trans community but has met with a tremendous backlash in recent years and you can understand why some politicians will look at that and say it's too risky we're fighting prejudice that's too deep rooted and too ingrained what would your advice be to a politician for example in belarus or in uganda because this is very difficult I mean, of course, it's very difficult. Like, I'm, I'm a Colombian, right? Like, Colombia, just 10 to 20 years ago, like, only 10% of the public would be comfortable having a queer or trans neighbor. But that has changed. It has changed drastically within the last couple of years, mainly because of two reasons. The first one has been the extremely creative and strong activism that the trans and queer communities have had within the country, but also because the states have shown support to these communities. It is to some degree the responsibilities of the states to educate their citizens and to provide the necessary laws to support and protect all of the communities, not just the majority. Because if that was the case and only the majorities would have the access to their rights, then we would not be living in a democracy. And so if they are aligned with the principles of democracy, if they are aligned with the principles of respecting the human rights of everyone and not just the majorities, then it is their responsibilities to legislate and make sure that everyone, including trans people, queer people, people of color, migrants, sex workers, have access to all the technologies necessary, but also the creation of campaigns that tackle all of this bigotry. I, I think it's the responsibility and my, my advice to them would be start by deconstructing your own challenges because let's face it, most of the times, the reasons why they refuse to legislate is because they are experiencing that transphobia themselves. Amelita. I want to ask you what impact that change in attitude, cultural, sexual, etc. in Colombia has had on marginalised groups' access to healthcare and the rate at which people are getting either infections or indeed getting access to treatment. From, from the sexual practices, then testing, then HIV diagnosis, there are a lot of different steps where transphobia can come in and stop people from having access to different services. So the main reasons would be that the attitudes from healthcare providers are usually so hostile to minorities that it makes them extremely difficult. It makes it very difficult for those minorities to make the decision to go and have such a service, right? So as a trans person, why would you go to a doctor that is misgendering you or that is death naming you, right? Or if you are a queer person, why would you go to a doctor that is going to judge you or slut shame you as the slang that we use in communities because of your sexual behaviors or your sexual uh, practices? It's a much more widespread issue that's not simply, I put that in inverted commas, you know, directed at people who are trans, but so many healthcare professionals are still not up to date with actually what the reality is of HIV today and what is possible. Not all that long ago, I had a woman who was looked after somewhere else who was basically still shamed for wanting to have a baby by a healthcare professional who just wasn't up to date with what was possible. And I've had young people and spoken to young people in different parts of the world as well who are themselves living with HIV. They're trying to do the right thing by going and accessing contraception. And they're actually, I think you used it, slut shamed or whatever. Why, what are you doing having sex? You know, they're trying to be responsible. And it's the negative approach that can occur within a lot of healthcare settings that, you know, you just won't come back. You just don't. You decide either to go to another clinic or just, well, I'm not going to bother because they're not very nice to me. And that's, I think we've got all the tools to end the epidemic. I really believe that, yes, we can create nicer things, easier things, whatever, but I don't think we need more or different drugs. It's really these more difficult things around the side, which are going to require everybody to think a little bit outside the box and, you know, how welcoming is our service? And, you know, are we really doing the right things to get to the people that will benefit from what there is available to them? Mm, which leads me to my next point, trust. And I'm hoping that Uni, who has her index finger raised, is going to build on uh, Anamiki, your point, and Amanita's point, because trust is almost the elephant in the room sometimes when we have discussions like this. Because you often hear leaders, political leaders, medical leaders, who say, why won't they trust us? We're trying to save their lives. Oni, you must take it away. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
But I do want to say that often the emphasis is on mistrust. That's sort of pathologizing the patient or the communities that are most marginalized, like, oh, it's too bad that they don't trust us. No, we need to focus on what we can do as healthcare providers, as healthcare institutions to be trustworthy, to gain communities trust, because we have done so much. I mean, one of my patients came in, he's gay, he's living with HIV, and another provider saw him and like completely shamed him for being gay. And this was an HIV care provider. So this person is not going to want to come back to care if he knows he's going to be treated that way. We really need to figure out how as healthcare providers and as institutions, we can figure out what matters to our patients. What are their priorities as opposed to what's the matter with them? What is your risk? And what are all these negative things about you? So trust is a big part. And in HIV, especially, there are a lot of myths about you know, HIV treatment. I don't want to call it myths. I'll call it counter narratives because they're based on people's experiences. People think that HIV treatment sometimes is meant to kill them, um, that there actually is a cure that exists that's being withheld. But again, these beliefs come out of the way that people are treated by the larger society in their day-to-day life. And so we need to really do better in terms of cultivating trustworthiness. I'm conscious we haven't really mentioned children growing up with HIV or in a household where a significant parent or guardian is living with HIV. Only do you see uh, the inequality that can come with that kind of status in your clinic among the people that you're working with? Right. So I think nowadays we're seeing more people who acquired HIV maybe 30, 40 years ago when they were born to parents or mothers living with HIV when HIV treatment was not available. And so those are individuals who've lived their whole lives with HIV and so have a particularly different experience uh, of HIV than folks who acquire it when they are adults. We're seeing many fewer children, thankfully, at least in the United States, that are born with HIV, thanks to, I mean, so much of the research that has been done, but also to very potent HIV medications. I think, Anamik, you might have a sense around this as well. Yeah, Goni, you hit the nail on the head. We are seeing some as well who are now in their 20s and have lived their whole life and are often in quite a difficult way, actually, with a number of them absolutely having had it with HIV and falling out of treatment, which I think is of concern. But newer infections in certain parts of the world are much reduced because of the interventions that are available. But in some parts, the mothers are not getting the interventions that they need. And then in other parts of the world, I'm thinking of Southern Africa in particular, women are acquiring HIV whilst they're pregnant or breastfeeding. So perhaps that opportunity to intervene was not apparent. And that's certainly something that needs to be looked at. Anamik's comment made me think about the promise of all the technologies that we have available, thinking about injectable PrEP and injectable treatment. So PrEP once a day or every two month injection, um, you know, making sure that we are getting women access to injectable PrEP, for instance, as an option in terms of preventing HIV. So there's tremendous, I think, unfulfilled, unrealized promise that I think new tools to prevent HIV and treat HIV can really sort of help in terms of closing that gap. Thank you, Oni. I want to talk about your sense of mission, each of you, because you've all been working in this area of healthcare for a number of years. And I'm looking at you smiling because of uh, your longevity in this field since 19... 19- 87. And I'm wondering what keeps you going, where the hope is, and whether you think we really can make significant inroads by 2030, which is that UN mandated target. Amanita, I'm going to start off with you. Can you explain where your sense of mission comes from? What keeps you going? Henry, that's a question that I have to answer to myself every day. And it's actually quite simple. I was infected with HIV when I was 22, and it was the result of uh, sexual abuse. While I was uh, in Germany, trying to get into a master's degree. And at the time, I was extremely lucky because I already had a bachelor's degree in microbiology, and I understood at the time what it meant to become HIV positive. And so I was privileged enough to have access to the education, to the languages, Yeah, basically to the knowledge, but also to the support of my family that allow me to not just overcome the infection myself, but also to be completely healthy and to live a life within the possibilities with no remorse or without that much stigma. 
And so, as RuPaul says, with great power comes great responsibility. And I just could not spend the rest of my life having all of this knowledge in biomedical sciences and being a trans woman of color with migrant experience who had done sex work, who had used drugs, who had experienced sexual abuse more than once. I could not be that person and then just completely ignore the pain of my community, a pain that I am extremely aware of because I have lived it on my own skin and having the tools and having the power to do the bare minimum to just like change something. So future generations do not have to go through the same things that I went through, but also so we use this as an opportunity to completely rewire the world and rethink a world, like rethink us this world into a place where we can actually all of us being without the necessity of live in fear for whether it is our gender identity or our race or our migration status, I was compelled. And every single day before I go to bed, I remember this because, well, every minute of my life, I'm breathing within the realm of the living, but also the realm of the death. And it's impossible to let it go. And it's impossible to forget it. So it's a very personal thing for me. And it just happens to be that I love microbiology and virology and epidemiology and yeah it almost feels like a calling as you say with great power comes great responsibility i think you attributed it to rupaul others would say it's spider-man or somebody even more heavenly i, I want to give it to a, a, a queer black person not spider-man sorry <laughs> thank you very much i appreciate where you're coming from amanita and Amik, uh, what about you because you've been on the front line but also in the boardroom for a number of decades, you clearly have a zeal, a sense of mission. But can you explain where it comes from and what keeps it strong? I'm assuming it is still strong. It's still strong. You don't have to worry about that. It's little things and big things. It's the young man the other day who came in and when he came in, he virtually didn't want to look up at me and was sort of looking at his feet. And, and we talked and we talked for a good, I think, 45 minutes. And in the end, he did walk out in a better space than when he came in. When that happens, you do think, I hope, I think, I hope I've made a little bit of difference and made him see that there is some hope. You know, when I started so many years ago, everybody died. You knew pretty quickly that anybody who was sick enough to come into hospital, they might come out, but they were going to come back in and then they were going to die. And it is extraordinary medically where we've come from and where we are now. That is an extraordinary difference. But in the stigma side of things, that for me is the thing that holds everything up. And it's not the easiest thing to really tackle. But thinking about what we're doing or we're involved with at Aviv, there's a lot of things that we do support within the communities and working with the communities and communities who work and do projects within the community. I've said community a hundred times. I can probably say even more. But that is so important because you may think you know what's best for something, but actually if you don't work with the community, you'll get precisely nowhere. Thank you, Anamik. Only what about you? I know that you come from a family of doctors. Your twin sister is a doctor. Your mother was a doctor. So I suspect it's in your DNA, but um, I suspect there is more to the story as well. Yes, no, sure. And I appreciate you mentioning my mother, because when I think about my mission and my purpose, I think about my mother who was born into poverty, raised by a single mother on public assistance, along with five other siblings, had the card stacked against her, had the Catholic nun in her elementary school tell her that she could never become a doctor, even if that's what she wanted, to then like show this nun otherwise and go on to college and medical school and really spent all of her career in um, the community in which we lived in Brooklyn, New York, really serving um, others. So I'm directly inspired by, by my mother who used to drag us along to community health fairs and we'd see her practicing in clinic. So like I always think about like optimism versus hope. Optimism is like we know what we're doing is going to lead to a positive outcome. But hope is actually we don't know. It's like this uncertainty, but we know that if we don't do what we need to do, put one foot in front of the other, that we have no chance of reaching the outcome that we want, whether it's end of HIV epidemic, the end of poverty, end of homelessness, whatever it is. So I feel like I've seen in New York City, for instance, we have had substantial declines since the start of the HIV epidemic in terms of HIV diagnoses. I mean, if you look at that curve, it's like a steep drop. 
So I know we have the potential. And just like Anamique said, we have the tools. We just need to listen to the communities that are most affected and do what we can, whether at a policy level as well, to make sure that the communities that are most affected are getting the tools that they need to stay safe. Thank you very much indeed to Dr. Oni Blackstock, Amanita Calderon Cifuentes, and Dr. Anamik de Ruta. You've been listening to Can We End Epidemics, a series of six episodes where we discuss disease prevention, health inequalities, the future of medicines, and health funding, among other issues. Do check out the glossary in our show notes for any terminology you might have missed. I'm Henry Bonsu, and until next time, thanks very much for listening.